March 28th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines of this hour. Starting with campaign season here in South Korea. Official campaigning for the upcoming general election has begun as of Thursday. Candidates are now able to deliver speeches in open areas and give out their name cards. Members of Seoul's bus labor union are on a strike for the first time in 12 years as of 4 a.m. this morning, with the drivers seeking a wage hiker. Hundreds of extra subway trains will be in operation until 2 a.m. South Korea and the United States have slapped yet another round of sanctions on six North Korean nationals and two third country entities for helping Pyongyang secure funds for its weapons and mass destruction programs. Official campaigning for the April general election is now in full swing here in South Korea. Eligible candidates vying for seats in the National Assembly are carrying out their campaigns for 13 days, up until the day before in-person voting on April 10th. Ruling People Power Party interim leader Han Dong-hun started off greeting people at a traditional market in the Songpago district of southeastern Seoul. And Lee Jae-myung, the main opposition Democratic Party's leader in the center of the capital at Yongsan Station. Candidates can use a public address systems to deliver speeches in open areas, as well as pass out their name cards. For the first time in 12 years, Seoul intercity bus drivers went on a strike at 4 a.m. Thursday. The move comes despite 11-hour marathon negotiations that began on Wednesday afternoon. Isung Jasmore. The Seoul Bus Labor Union and representatives from management began last-minute negotiation talks on Wednesday at around 3 p.m. That meeting lasted for 11 hours before the labor union called for an end to the discussions in the early hours of Thursday morning. By 4 a.m., the union declared that its drivers would go on a strike, marking the first strike by Seoul's intercity bus drivers in 12 years. However, there is still hope that the two sides can agree to end the general strike as soon as possible. Despite the breakdown in negotiations, working level talks are still ongoing and attention is now being paid to how much the gap will be narrowed during this process and whether an agreement can be reached. The key issue behind the talks is a wage increase. The 18,000 member union has reportedly asked for a 12.7 percent increase in their hourly wage, a revision of their salary system and the abolition of wage discrimination for contract workers. The union is arguing that the increase in wages will also prevent manpower outflow to the Incheon and Gyeonggi regions. However, the management side has stressed that such an increase is excessive compared to the inflation and wage increase rates over the past five years. The Regional Labor Relations Commission, which has been mediating the negotiations, proposed a 6.1 percent increase, but ultimately failed to reach arbitration. With the general strike by the union, 7,210 buses, or 97.6 percent of all Seoul City buses, are now out of service. The last time drivers went on strike was in 2012. However, at the time, the partial strike only lasted for 20 minutes, avoiding any inconvenience to commuters. With this strike expected to last longer, Seoul City began operating emergency transportation measures to minimize inconvenience to commuters by extending and increasing subway services. To quickly connect subway commutes, free shuttle buses are also operating in Seoul's 25 autonomous districts. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Now, on to the latest with the medical standoff. Having reaffirmed its intentions to push ahead with the medical school admissions quota expansion, the government is now sharing its plans for a special health care allocation from the national budget. Our Che soo has more. Amidst the ongoing conflict regarding the government increasing the medical school enrollment quarter, the health ministry said it will announce a special budget by the end of May. To ensure concentrated and stable funding, we plan to operate a special account for essential medical services. The next two months will be the most important time for budget planning, with a budget request submitted to the Ministry of Economy and Finance by the end of May. 
Meanwhile, the presidential office announced plans on Wednesday to increase health care spending to ensure that essential medical services are restored to their appropriate levels. The USCQO administration plans to place the healthcare sector on an equal footing with constitutional duties such as security and public safety. The government aims to make bold investments into medical services. In the spending plan, the government announced it promised to take over the responsibility for the practical training of trainee doctors itself. The government will also allocate additional funding to regional health care and research and development into the expansion of essential medical services outside Seoul. Munal, it is sticking to its regional medical school quota, increased to 2,000 students beginning next year and has finalized allocations for each school. At the same time, the government continues to urge for dialogue with the Korean Medical Association. On Tuesday, pediatrician Im hyun Tech was elected as the new leader of the KMA with 65 percent of the votes cast. He has voiced opposition to the government's plan and could push for an even larger scale collective action. The exodus of medical school professors nationwide has continued, including almost 430 at Ulsan University and around 400 at Seoul National University. To minimize disruption to patient care, the government says it will deploy an additional 1,900 physician assistant nurses and 200 more public health doctors. Cha Su Hyung, Arirang News. An end to skyrocketing prices for fruit and vegetables is high on the government's agenda, with measures in place to bring costs under control. But it doesn't apply to all items, and for how long will they be available at affordable prices? For more, we're joined by Professor Oh Jun Sok. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. To tame fruit and vegetable prices that have skyrocketed in recent weeks here in the country, the government has given support for delivery unit prices for some items. Professor, how effective are they? Mm -hmm. uh, inflation has been moderating, though. Uh, the pace has been slower than earlier expected. Uh, it's forecast uh, to continue before reaching the target rate of 2% around the end of this year uh, due to high oil and fresh food prices. Consumer prices uh, uh, stands uh, nowadays at 3.1% uh, on high prices, uh, especially uh, f uh, vegetables and the fruits and other fresh food, uh, and as well as high energy cost. Uh, prices of 18 major kind of uh, fruits, uh, including apple, pears, tangerines, uh, strawberries, uh, and then sweet persimmons combined storage, 41.2% last month, the largest increase in more than 32 years. As a result of this fruit inflation, Korea's uh, fruit consumption has diminished by almost 20 percent over the past 15 years. Import is made in a hurry uh, to handle it, uh, including oranges, bananas, pineapples, mangoes, uh, and then uh, grapefruits. Uh, 28 import items are subject to tariff exemption. Government has, in this way, implemented intensive uh, discount program and other campaigns recently to lower prices of agricultural products and everyday items uh, by using more than 113 billion U.S. dollars worth of the country budget. As apple prices have more than doubled over the past two years, of course, uh, this program uh, will work temporarily in the market. Uh, the spikes, however, will likely soon return to continue throughout the year because they are insufficient to increase supply. Reduced production might be the key factor. Uh, price is not the cause, but the result. Uh, supply is the cause. Uh, so we cannot control all normal weather conditions. We cannot control the damage caused by the low temperature during the spring blooming and uh, summer downpours. But we can control the supply and alternative supply by way of import. Uh, that might be uh, the right approach. Right. And I also couldn't help but notice at supermarkets how the price of cherry tomatoes, not just regular mm -hmm. tomatoes, has jumped over 30 percent compared to a year ago. Professor Oh, what's the reason for this? Uh-huh. Yeah. Tomatoes are uh, seasonal crop, uh, and their availability is influenced uh, by the specific growing season in different regions. Uh, let me tell you uh, the why price increase of tomatoes first. Uh, first, a weather condition was not that advantageous. 
mm -hmm. it could be uh, we could remember that last numbers long downpour and scorching heat wave caused a high volatility uh, second environmental disaster uh, we are heading for uh, is another key factor in the global food uh, shortage high temperature heat waves and uh, hydric stress are uh, hindering uh, the uh, crop of different fruits and vegetables and a third as to the optimization of the program this is uh, the most important few potatoes were selected and planted or to be ultimately replaced by the more profitable crops if uh, the type of tomato uh, is not pricey uh, they do not uh, they did not plant it and uh, this is why the price of tomato goes up then one makes price of a tomato and cherry tomato uh, most differently government intervention Mm -hmm. As we already know, the government has implemented intensive discount program and other campaigns re recently to lower prices. Cherry tomato is not in the list while tomato was in the list. Government intervention could uh, set the fire in the market but never keep the fire in the market. Unfavorably, weather condition and the structural issue of the industry uh, is, it, uh, uh, is not actually the uh, one of factors. Now is the government turn to build up handling capability for device measures to boost up the competitiveness of the fresh farming and revamp its logistics structure. I see. So retail prices of fruits like mm -hmm. apples and tomatoes have been lowered, the regular tomatoes. But there are also concerns that wholesale prices are on the rise. What's causing wholesale prices to go up then? Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, it's due to government. It's uh, true the wholesale price of apple has more than doubled this year. Mm -hmm. uh, wholesale price of pears also exceed at uh, 100,001 mark for 15 kilograms. Retail price sold in large discount stores and traditional markets have also risen considerably from a year ago. As we already know, the government has recently reduced the price in retail price due to government discount support system. This program is limited retail prices only. Wholesale prices are not in the discount support program. Wholesale prices are not subject to discount, are still more than twice as high as they were a year ago. Of course, it's a business secret. Beneath the market, uh, the, the distribution channel itself chronically generated inefficiency due to complexity in the process of handling fresh goods, especially in the agricultural uh, sectors. Uh, in the aftermath of the weather disaster, apple and pear production fell 30.3% and 26.8% respectively last year. In this way, there is still a possibility that retail prices will rise again as the shortage are reduced and the uh, government's the discount uh, support is uh, very limited. It will be a relief for the moment that the government supplies apple and pears in large quantities, not controlling the price uh, in preparation for the increase in demand during the peak season, uh, though the storage volume is also somewhat insufficient. All right, Professor, well, thank you as always for your insights. Mm -hmm. You have a wonderful day. Mm, thank you. South Korea and the U.S. have issued another set of sanctions against North Korea as part of their latest efforts to cut off sources of funding used for North Korea's nuclear and missile program. Our Payunji has the details. South Korea and the U.S. have newly added two entities and four individuals to their sanctions list for their involvement in illicit financing and generating revenue through overseas North Korean information technology workers that are used to fund the regime's nuclear and missile development. This includes a UAE-based firm called Pioneer Bencon Star Real Estate and a Russia-based company called Alice LLC. South Korea's foreign ministry explained Thursday that the two companies were sanctioned for engaging in the dispatch and operations of North Korean IT workers abroad. Also on the sanctions list are four bank representatives, Yu Bu, Han Terman, Jung Song Ho, and Oh In Jun, for evading sanctions and funding North Korea's nuclear missile development through illegal financial activities such as money laundering. The foreign ministry said Yu Boong in particular is a person that South Korea and the U.S. have both been tracking. 
The U.S. State Department also described you as a linchpin in North Korea's illicit financial activities and a person that's skilled at employing various schemes to avoid detection. The latest action aligns with the 6th South Korea-U.S. Working Group meeting to counter North Korean cyber threats, a two-day meeting that began Wednesday in Washington, D.C. Seoul's foreign ministry said the sanctions are expected to raise awareness of the risks related to transactions involving these individuals and entities, not just domestically, but also within the international community. A recent report by a panel of experts at the United Nations shows North Korea has obtained about half of its total foreign currency income through financial theft, such as hacking and cyber attacks. And these funds were used to cover 40 percent of the resources needed for developing weapons of mass destruction. Peunji, Arirang News. The U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Kirk Campbell spoke with China's Executive Vice Foreign Minister Ma Xiaozu on Wednesday local time. The State Department said the call was a part of ongoing efforts to maintain a bilateral communication line. The importance of peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula was emphasized in the call, as well as the Taiwan Strait and South China Sea. Campbell and Ma discussed the two countries' relationship and global issues, including areas of difference and cooperation. Also, Campbell raised concerns about China's support for Russia's military in its war against Ukraine. Some experts say trade issues could have been also discussed, given China's recent complaint against the U.S. to the WTO after Chinese companies were excluded from electric vehicle subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba has asked Seoul to transfer its Patriot surface-to-air missile system to Kyiv. Despite South Korea's firm stance that it will not supply lethal weapons to Ukraine, Ukraine's top diplomat stressed that the missile system is non-lethal as it only shoots down missiles. Kuleba argued that because North Korea continues to support Russia militarily, South Korea's best strategic security interest would be to help Ukraine. He further emphasized that if South Korea's allies follow the same logic of non-lethal weapons support in the 1950s, South Korea would have been defeated by the North and would not exist today. The envoy also said he understands that decisions have to be made by each country regarding aid to Ukraine. President Yoon suk yeol was handed a trophy awarding his courage in renewing ties with Tokyo and strengthening three-way cooperation with the U.S. to promote global peace and prosperity. The honor was delivered in person by the daughter of former U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Our Oh si reports. President Yoon suk yeol has received an award he won last year from the John F. Kennedy Foundation for his courage and determination to pursue better bilateral ties with Japan for peace and prosperity for the region and the world. On Wednesday, Yoon met with Caroline Kennedy, the Foundation's honorary president and the current U.S. ambassador to Australia, who had requested to deliver the award herself. She is the only surviving child of the former U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Yoon had won the International Profile and Courage Award last year with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for working to improve bilateral ties despite domestic opposition arising from historical issues. In particular, the foundation had noted Yoon's efforts towards rapprochement with Japan shortly after assuming office. It added that such courage to choose a more hopeful future led to a historic level of trilateral cooperation between the U.S. and two of its most important democratic allies at their Camp David summit last August. Ambassador Kennedy said it was an honor to personally present the trophy to Yoon, noting he had pushed for the good of his people, nation and the world, despite political opposition. Her husband, designer Edwin Schlossberg, who accompanied her to Seoul, had designed the trophy, modeling it on the shape of a lantern used on the USS Constitution warship to signify sincerity and courage amid external pressure. Yoon said he was deeply moved to receive an award from former President Kennedy's family, pledging further efforts towards peace in the Indo-Pacific based on trilateral cooperation with the U.S. and Japan. He noted the honor symbolizes the former U.S. leader's new frontier spirit, which envisioned a better future during hard times through social and economic reforms. A senior official at Yoon's office told Arirang News that it is through the same courage and a sense of mission based on the new frontier spirit that the president has tackled illegal labor union activities, promoted education reform, and steadily pushes for medical reform despite the political disadvantages that may come his way.
Previous recipients of the Courage Award include Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, U.S. Presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush, and former U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan. Oseong Arirang News. Good morning. I'm Kim Xiong, and now we turn off the stories from around the world. We begin today in Indonesia, where two losing presidential candidates have demanded a revote, alleging fraud at the polls and general irregularities. Indonesia's top court began hearing the appeals of the two candidates, Anis Baswedan and Ganjar Pronowo, on Wednesday. The results of the February 14th election announced on March 20th indicated that Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto won 58.6% of the votes. Former Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan and former Central Java Governor Ganjar Pranowo trailed Subianto with 24.9% and 16.5% of votes, respectively. Baswedan and Pranowo both claim irregularities and are critical of Subianto's running mate, 37-year-old Rakabuming Raka, the son of the outgoing president, Joko Widodo. The country's top court, at the time led by Widodo's brother-in-law, made an exception for Raka to run despite the minimum age requirement for candidates being 40. Pranowo is demanding that election results be annulled and the winners be disqualified, saying that a firm stand must be taken to reject oppression, including the government's use of state resources and the security forces to support certain candidates. Thailand's lower house of parliament passed the marriage equality bill on Wednesday, moving a step closer to legalizing same-sex unions. If approved through all legal procedures, Thailand will become the third territory in Asia to legally protect equal marriage rights. The bill had full support in parliament with 400 votes for and 10 against from the 415 members. Some lawmakers displayed the LGBT flag during the session and many applauded as the flag was waved after the bill was confirmed to have passed. Initially, one of the 400 parliamentarians accidentally pressed the wrong button, showing 399 in favour, but the error was amended accordingly. Thailand's marriage equality bill now must acquire the Senate's approval and the King's endorsement before it becomes law. A bus crash on a motorway in eastern Germany, close to Leipzig, has killed at least five people and injured around 50. The bus, operated by Flixbus, was on the busy A9 motorway connecting Berlin to Munich before it swerved to the right and ending up on its side. Leipzig's police sports spokesperson Olaf Hopp said at the site of the crash that while five people were killed, that number is not yet verified. Felix Bus also commented that the exact circumstances of the accident are not yet known. While the police said the figures were only based on the number of seat bookings, some 53 passengers and two drivers were on the bus travelling from Berlin to the Swiss city of Zurich. Now to Russia, where two polar bear cubs have taken their first steps outside in the snow at an eastern Siberian zoo. According to a staff member at the Orthodoidu Zoo, the cubs were born in December 2023, but the mother of the cubs did not allow them to venture outside until they became strong enough. The cubs are born blind and weak, weighing only around 500 grams. The mother bear, named Kolimana, was found orphaned in 2012 at a natural reserve in Yakutia's far northeastern Arctic Ocean coast. The father, named Lomonosov, was born at the Leningrad Zoo in St. Petersburg and later moved to Siberia. The zoo's name, Orthodoidu, means middle word, world, in Yakutia's Sakha language. According to local myth, the middle world is where animals and humans thrive, while the upper world is inhabited by the gods.
Good morning. It's a wet day again. These rain clouds will cover the entire country from this afternoon into tonight. And especially those of us in central regions need to be aware that rain could be mixed with yellow dust. Meanwhile, mountains, regions and Jeju and parts of Gyeongsangdo could see up to 80 millimeters of heavy spring showers, along with thunderstorms and strong wind. Afternoon highs will not rise that much, going down 1 to 5 degrees lower than Wednesday, topping out at 14 degrees in the capital, Gwangju and Busan this afternoon. And the change of weather we've had this month made for an unpredictable cherry blossom season. Colder than normal seasonal temperatures and the lack of sunshine due to that frequent rain are behind the delay. Cherry blossom festivals kicked off across Korea, but it will take extra days for the full bloom bloom to appear. But at least the weather conditions will turn more promising from tomorrow for the flowering. That's Korea for you and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for our Friday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time. Welcome. Welcome. I mean, uh, a lot of layers, a lot of mystery. We're not sure what's happening. They're setting him up, uh, the, you know, the husband to be a kind of like mysterious bad guy, but maybe he has a good reason. We gotta find out. I don't know.
엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 하나, 둘, 셋! 끝없이 쏟아지는 포터스파 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 웰컴 24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 
talk, but luckily we don't see violence on a daily basis here. I think you shed light to something really important. Korean subway systems, they have a lot of glass doors or automated doors that really it doesn't make it physically possible for you to be shoving someone to the tracks, mm -hmm. though you don't want to even imagine that. And also, though we are seeing a lot of safety measures in place, the matter of overcrowdedness is still an issue. But apart from that, what are some other safety concerns here in Korea's metro? Well, just talking about um, the incident in New York, you know, considering how many people commute mm. on these busy subways on a yeah. daily basis, it's kind of no surprise to see these kind of accidents do happen. Um, but I think it's just really sad to see how officials intervene after mm. a case like this happens, when it could have been prevented much before. Uh, like what Walter said, now, a stabbing incident happened in a subway station in Seoul back yeah. in 2022. And after the incident, many policemen were on patrol in subways for a while, even in like Gangnam Station mm. as well. But nowadays, you don't really see any policemen yeah. on patrol, which is kind of weird to see. So as much as we think, you know, Korea is a very safe, safe country compared to other countries, I still believe that, you know, no way in this world is very safe at the moment. Yeah. So I think, you know, as individuals, we need to be extra careful and just stay alert at all times. Exactly, mm. and take preventive measures. And I True. think the New York City is doing a good job by patrolling a lot of 800 officers there and hopefully unlike Korea, we'll see them stay put for a while until better measures are introduced. Now, switching gears to our main discussion topic of the day now. Last year, the number of foreigners that visited South Korea for tourism surpassed 10 million. That was a remarkable surge since the end of COVID-19 travel restrictions. And another notable difference since the pandemic was that the average age group of inbound travelers came down. Now, the majority of foreigners who decided to pay a visit to Korea were in their 20s. Now, Kiyun, why don't you start us off by giving us a bit more detail as to who and from which countries most people came to visit South Korea? Sure. Um, like you mentioned, the age group of foreign tourists coming to South Korea has dropped over the years. Mm -hmm. um, to give our viewers a better understanding of the actual figures, let's take a look at the screen. So according to the Korean Tourism Organization, in 2023, uh, there were a total number of 11.03 million foreign tourists that visited Korea. The biggest portion was taken up by those 30 and under at 35.6. Mm -hmm. The second biggest were those between 31 to 40 at 20.6%. So we can clearly see that over half of the travelers from overseas were MZers like us, again illustrating Korea as a hot tourist destination among them. Another interesting thing to note is that many young people from France, the UK, Mexico and Australia are choosing Korea as their vacation spot. A few decades ago, um, travelers were usually from Asian countries like China, Japan and from Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. But now we're seeing more from Europe and South America fly in. So. Just last week, I had a chance to meet an MZA who mm. came from Paris, a Parisian, and she was telling me how everything about Korea was so good, like from the people, culture, food, and so on. But it was so convenient in the sense that the Korean tourism industry was very foreigner friendly. Right. And the websites and the service they provide um, improved so much compared to uh, pre-COVID when she last visited Korea. So mm. it was very surprising to hear that. So in just three years time, we've seen so much mm -hmm. advancements mm -hmm. and we're becoming more foreigner or tourist friendly. But Walter, why do you think such a young age group is actually coming into Korea these days? I mean, we can't mention the younger age group without mentioning uh, K-content. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the big attraction is here in South Korea. We all know the younger and, you know, some of the older generation as well love their K-content with, uh, uh, you know, with the continued popularity of K-pop, like with bands such as Blackpink and of course BTS, uh, movies such as Parasite, dramas such as Squid Games, we know that these are massive globally and all the younger generation are watching these and listening to these types of media. But also K-gaming as well, we shouldn't forget, is one of our biggest exports. Korea has a massive load of exports to give to the younger generation and hence why this country is seeing this huge influx of Gen Zers coming into Korea. Exactly. You mentioned a great point. Esports, we're such mm -hmm. a strong country when it comes to esports, and I think that's another cultural product that we are selling to a lot of people. But as our visitors are getting younger and younger, I'm quite curious as to what they usually enjoy once they're here. A lot of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's no secret that K-pop mm -hmm. was the first to start the whole trend of adding the letter K yeah. to almost everything about Korea. Now to, you know, K-culture, K-food and so on. Even though there are other countries that begin with the letter K, like Kenya and Kuwait, mm -hmm. people immediately think of Korea first, which shows the big global rise of Korea's soft power. Now, ever since the start of the Hallyu wave, uh, many young visitors have come to Korea to see the buildings of big entertainment companies like SM, YG, Hive and JYP. Mm. 
Now, despite knowing they have a very slim chance of meeting their favorite artists in person, they're still happy to just take photos of buildings to upload on their social media. Right. And in terms of location, considering that Hive and SM are in the central Seoul area, YG is further northwest and JYP more east of Seoul. Mm -hmm. But before, you know, many were clustered in the Cheongdam Akkojong area in the, in the Gangnam district, district. Sorry, But since the relocation, more foreign visitors are visiting different areas of Seoul outside the Gangnam district. So mm -hmm. consequently, business sales around those big companies have boosted over the years. And a report from BC Card, a credit card company in Korea, compared to the year 2020, in 2023, foreign visitor spending increased a whopping 17 times wow. in Songsudong area where SM Entertainment mm -hmm. is and four times in areas where YG Hive and JYP is located. Mm -hmm. So I think the numbers speak for themselves. Um, K-pop is definitely a reason for many young people traveling to Korea. But I just want to mention that Korea isn't just all about Seoul. Sure. <laughs> there are so many other beautiful destinations across the country. I would like to recommend from obviously, you know, we have Jeju Island, mm. there's Busan, Gangwon-do area, Jeonju, Gyeongju, Tongyeong, and the list just goes on. So yeah. I'd like to recommend these places as well, other than Seoul. Exactly. And if even if you do come just for K-pop purposes, whether that be going to see your favorite entertainment agency or eating at a cafe that your K-pop idol went to, mm. I do think you mentioned a great point there. Outside of Seoul, there's so many other attractions. And if you're a K-pop fan, you might know, but these members aren't just born and raised in Seoul. They're from different parts of the region, which is exactly why I would also recommend going to rural areas. But Walter, would you like to add on as to what the younger generation, the young tourists are doing once they hit South Korea. I mean, it's all got to do with K-content. Everything that they consume, there is some sort of effect that goes on. And that also comes down to food. Now, if we go through the food the, um, that some of the movies and dramas go through, we can just, ex they get to experience the tastiness. Example, japukuri and as well as jajangmyeon, uh, or let's say soju, kim, dokbuk, Kimbap, anything like that. People are just obsessed with Korean food. I mean, Korean chicken these days. I know that when there was a drama out that showed Korean chicken, that actually Korean chicken prices went up in certain areas around the world. Yeah. So I definitely think while people are here, they just don't want to see fake places. They want to eat the great food instead. Exactly, like japaguri, all the yeah. chicken out there. And I think you mentioned a great point as to because we're seeing such a plethora of K content out there, whether it be on OTT platforms or through movies, you want to try out what your favorite celebrity crush is trying out as well, and food is a very important part. Now, to better find out what foreigners want to do when they visit Korea, we asked our global viewers for their own thoughts. If you take a look at the screen, you can find out what three of them had to share with us. Let's start with the Power Ranger. The Power Ranger said, my goal for traveling to Korea is to see a K-pop promo show and try many Korean food like chicken, hot dogs, and noodles. Tears Bell says, I'm coming to Korea at the end of June this year. I'm an avid Sehgook watcher and history buff, so I'm looking forward to visiting the Five Grand Palaces as well as Chung Shrine. Leon said, as a huge K-pop fan, I'd love to attend a concert or fan meeting of my favorite K-pop idols. Also, I'd like to visit stores which sell K-pop albums and merchandise. And we're now going to turn to a fellow Gen Z who's visited Korea several times himself, all the way from Bulgaria. So stay tuned for a live interview. We're going to include a Gen Z from Bulgaria who loves traveling to Seoul so much he came not just once but several times. It's Alex Yevnavje Helyaskov, a Bulgarian Gen Z, joining us live from Tilburg. Welcome, Alex. Hello, great to be here. All right, so why don't you start us off by telling us when you first came to Korea and why? Okay, so I came first in Korea back in 2019. I came with my dad, it was before the pandemic. And why we came because we wanted to visit Korea because it had become so popular. And also because the Korean embassy in Bulgaria had organized an event in my city. And we really wanted to visit Seoul after that. Mm. Okay, so uh, since then, how many more times did you come? And what made South Korea such an appealing travel destination for you, Alex? 
So since then, I've came twice more. Wow. Um, first in 2022, and um, the last time was just last year in 2023. Um, actually, the first two times I stayed only in Seoul and a little bit in Suwon. There's just so much to see and do there, and I always run out of time to go to other places. Yeah. But um, last year, I went also to Busan, Andong, Gyeongju, and Jeju Island. Wow. Um, I think the reason why is because Korea is so welcoming and so accessible. Um, as a foreigner, you could get anywhere pretty easily. I think it's super straightforward. And also, it's so beautiful. Korea has incredible nature, super delicious food, rich history and culture. And I'm never, never bored there. Well, that's great to hear that you sound actually like a very well-traveled person now here in Korea. So would you give any tips you'd like uh, to people who are wanting to come to Korea? Uh, where are some must visit places and what are some experiences you would like them to try out? Okay, um, I have just one tip and that is try everything. Korea <laughs> has so much to offer and you can experience so much there. So personally, I will start with the must-do things, that is walking around the Gyeongbokgung Palace in the traditional Hanbok, seeing the entirety of Seoul atop the Namsan Tower, um, trying seafood in Busan, and also hiking in the volcano and lava cave of Jeju Island. Um, something that I would recommend young people to experience, especially in Seoul, is um, go to a cream cafe or a painting cafe. Mm. Um, this is where you could get creative and draw while having a cup of coffee. Um, also, you can go try a dance class, do some choreography there. Mm -hmm. um, you can also go check out what pop-up stores there are in the Songsu area when at the time of your visit. And something that I really, really, really like is going to Nodal Island with friends for picnic and also to watch the sunset. Um, this is really, really special to me, so definitely try that one. Um, even so, and also if you're going to um, other other cities, I would definitely recommend Andong and Gyeongju. It's like super historical. I really, really loved it. Mm. And of course, Busan is great as well. You can go to the beaches there. You can um, go swimming. It's right. it's incredible. I mean, Korea is just amazing. Alex, though I'm living in South Korea myself, your interview just made me realize how beautiful of a country I'm living in. And I also want to go to all the different places that you've mentioned so far. Thank you so much. It was such an insightful interview with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. All right, now ending off, the Korean government has been trying to secure a steady number of young international tourists to visit Korea, and I'd like to shed light as to what their efforts have been like so far and how you would like to see these policies go on from now. Right, so Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism is working with the Korean Tourism Organization uh, mm -hmm. to come up with more diverse tourist packages and themes like K-sports and K-beauty mm -hmm. that goes beyond K-content, as we saw very recently with a MLB season opener held yeah. in you know, Seoul. And furthermore, you know, theme products related to esports, like Walter mentioned before, have been made to bring in like more Chinese tourists who uh, who like to come here to learn more about the gaming industry and also like learn how to play games better from mm. like professional Korean gamers. Mm. And also, um, there, there are more programs that are made targeting students from Japan uh, to come to Korea for their school excursions and. Uh, personally, moving forward, I'd like to see South Korea become a more, you know, multicultural and multiracial um, country, opening its borders to uh, a lot of foreigners and taking into consideration at the same time both quantity and quality, mm -hmm. uh, so that for people who seek like new life in Korea, they feel more welcome because yeah. we are receiving a lot of tourists right now, which is a great sign for the tourism uh, industry. But at the same time, you know, our population is shrinking, yes. you know, <laughs> and it's like we have the lowest fertility rate in the world. So we need to be accepting more foreigners to, mm -hmm. you know, build a workforce and to, you know, help the country in ov overall. So I think we should uh, come up with better policies that support and protect uh, foreigners that want to actually live in Korea. Exactly, mm. because as we just heard from the interview with Alex, I mean, once you're here, you mm. can realize the wonders and beauties of this country. And hopefully, if we have better policies, it doesn't end off with just being a trip, 
but you can think about it as a next destination for you Definitely. to be living here. Yeah. What about you, Walter? What are you? Uh, so, well, as Alex said, actually, even though the younger generation are coming to Korea, they are also interested in, in just our culture itself. It doesn't have to be K content. It doesn't have to be the movies, the, the songs, or whatever. It can be the historical value as well of Korea. So I know that Korean, the Korean government are holding events such as making kimchi during the kimchi season, mm -hmm. as well as also there's a mud festival in Boryong, like yeah. every, uh, I think it's every spring or autumn. Mm -hmm. Anyway. These sort of, sort, of, sort of the events that the government are holding to attract a lot of foreign tourists and I recommend that you definitely look into them before you come to Korea because not only do you want to see the modern day style of Korea but also the historical side of Korea because it's so beautiful. Because as you mentioned and Q mentioned this as well, it's not just the capital region where we're seeing a lot of pop-up stores and a lot of trendy things for you to enjoy but it's just the whole of the nation. There's other rural regions where you can really enjoy a better, a better better and deeper uh, taste of culture, I believe. Now, before I end off, I'd like to ask you one last question very briefly. So what would you recommend people to do once they're here? Like, if your friend came to Korea right now, where would you take them? Obviously, Seoul is the hot spot for mm -hmm. everyone, but my second hot spot would have to be Busan. Oh, I've why? been there like 10 times already mm -hmm. after Jeju. Um, I think it really reminds me of where I used to live back in Sydney mm. with the beautiful beaches. Everyone's very relaxed, laid back, you know. Right. And I think the lifestyle is very different to where you live because people in Gangwon-do where there are a lot of mountains, like their style of living is very different <laughs> to people who live in Busan. But True. I love the chilled, relaxed vibe mm. uh, people uh, in Busan have and I'll definitely recommend people who want, who love the beaches or who wants to go for a little surf or yeah. whatever or just enjoy seafood of Busan, the definitely amazing. visit Busan. Visit Busan. What about you, Walter? I'm just going to go basically across the waters to Jeju Island mm. because yeah, Jeju Island is very similar to Busan in many ways. I mean, it's got some great food. It's got the ocean as well. It's, it's Since it's an island, it's surrounded by water and there are many different kinds of beaches. The food is amazing. Oh, really? Like Kyun, I've been there several times. Mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely recommend Jeju Island. And especially now, it's springtime and we're seeing so many cherry blossom mm. trees out, a lot of flowers blossoming. Now is the time to come to Korea and hopefully today's episode could not only help you planning out your itinerary, but hopefully it could be a travel destination that you put on your list. Now, in the meantime, we'll be here every day from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks to Park ki -hoon Always a pleasure. And Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. All right, and thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We are News, News Generation. Generation.